weeks. Um, so I posted this on Twitter for people to read it if they wanted before this stream. I don't know if anyone did, but um, this is Domenico Lacerdo, who everyone should read and reread and study. Um, fantastic Italian Marxist-Leninist thinker. And this is his, um, what ends up being a defense of China, but it's um, just an essay on his China turn to capitalism. Um, and what he does is assess China's reform and opening up policy, um, compares it to uh, the NEP in the USSR, um, talks about the vast reduction of what he calls global. Well, he, he breaks it down into two different kinds of inequality. You have inequality within the, the masses and or I mean, within the people or inequality within China between the working masses and um, the capitalists. Um, but then you also have global inequality. Um, so what's been most important for China in, you know, the reform and opening up period and uh, the, the period where they're trying to increase their productive forces has been combating this global inequality, bringing up the standard of living um, for the country as a whole. Um, and then in the, in the last 20 years or so, we've seen them move towards this um, new goal of common prosperity or Deng Xiaoping called common prosperity where they've cracked down on corruption. They've launched these um, efforts to reduce inequality within China. Um, they've done the poverty alleviation efforts, which has led to the incredible achievement um, that is the, the eradication of relative poverty in China. Um, so not only have they greatly increased the productive forces the way that they've aimed to, um, they've also done a lot to rein in um, what Deng Xiaoping called the animal spirits of the market or the animal spirits of capitalism that they knew were going to need to be contained when um, the reform and opening up policy was gone through with. Um, so they make a distinction. I've heard Carlos talk about this plenty of times between the political um, expropriation of power versus economic. So basically, you know, we can have capitalists so long as the state remains in control of the working class or the working class remains in control of the state. And so long as the state keeps tabs on, um, as we said, the animal spirits of, of capital. Um, so yeah, it's, it's probably the best defense of socialist China um, that I've seen in this succinct the form. Obviously there are longer books expounding on this idea, but it's incredible to read. It's only like 16, 17 pages. And I recommend everybody check it out. Yeah, I, uh, I quote it quite a bit in my book on the purity fetish. I have a whole chapter um, addressing how the purity fetish relates itself to Western Marxist analysis of China. And this essay and also the one that Roland Bower does, that's called Not Some Otherism, where he goes like point by point uh, through various categorizations of Western Marxism on, on China, state capitalists, authoritarian capitalists, uh, state communists, capitalist socialism, etc. And he debunks all of them. Um, so he does a, a similar uh, thing to what Roland Bauer does here, just take the assumptions on China and just completely destroy them. But that distinction between international inequalities and national inequalities is so important. And uh, it's a form of class struggle. And this is something that you get quite explicitly in other of the sort of texts you have, for instance, in his class struggles, uh, perhaps the best formulation of what the Marxist understanding of class and class, the theory of class struggle is. And of course, you have in the manifesto, the famous line, the history of all earth or existing societies is the history of class struggles. It's plural. It's not just one specific form of struggle. And um, what this ends up implying is that class struggle ends up being a universal and like all universals within uh, the dialectical tradition, we don't think that these universals are separate from the particular, where you have the universal here and the particular here. If we're talking about class struggle as a universal, that means it always has to take a specific form. Sometimes it takes the form of the proletariat directly fighting back in, in the shop floor. Sometimes it takes the form of peasant revolt. It takes different forms. And the U.S. has taken uh, specifically the form of, uh, uh, many times, specifically the form of the struggle against racism and against racist false consciousness. Uh, the first form, Engel says, that it took is the struggle against uh, patriarchy and, and the struggle against uh, sexism. Um, and it takes a, a wide variety of forms. And it's in national liberation struggles, the form that that class struggle takes is the form of national liberation. And so this is fundamentally an important distinction from the people that talk about all these struggles as different forms of struggles. 
that are not class struggles. And so when you have this framework of like a national liberation struggle is a form of class struggle. And when you look at capitalism, not just as like a national affair, but as an international global phenomenon, when China is bridging the global uh, inequality gap, what it's doing is advancing the international class struggle. It's as a nation, it's advancing its class interest and pushing back against the power of the imperialist. So it's an, it's an incredible advancement for socialism. And of course, it did that first, and it, it's bridged that inequality before getting to the national forms of inequalities that it does in the Xi Jinping era with uh, the turn towards common prosperity. But uh, Lozuro, as always, he ends up highlighting very nicely things that are implicit in Marx's analysis, but he takes them to their logical conclusion, and he shows how that's the case. And um, this distinction between political and economic capital, I find it to be so important. And again, it's grounded in Marx. Marx does not have a, um, a, a doctrine where he says, this is what socialism is. If you don't live up to these pure ideas, you're not uh, actually socialist. You're, it's not real socialism, as uh, the Western Marxists are fond of saying. That's the form of Marxism that I call the purity fetish, the purity fetish Marxism. That's not at all how uh, Marx, Engels, Lenin, Mao, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, think about Marxism and socialism. It's in a completely different form. What they prioritize is the real movement of history, which abolishes the present state of things, real social relations, overturning how it is that things are. And in the manifesto, Marx is very specific about the fact that the proletariat grabs political power, it grabs political power, and then it rests by degree the capital of the capitalist. So it's you take away the capital and you nationalize it in accordance to the role that it can play in developing the forces of production. So uh, if capital is playing a fettering role, then of course you nationalize it and you speed up the, the role that it can play in development. This is what you have in the five-year plans with Stalin and the process of collectivization. This is, I think, what the U.S. is probably going to look like. We've had a lot of, um, we already are a, a, a developed society almost crumbling and uh, and capitals playing a genuine, strong, fettering role to the development of the productive forces. So I think the path of nationalization and uh, a more focused expropriation of economic capital is going to be very important. Um, but in China, that wasn't the case. It came uh, from a semi-colonial, uh, semi-feudal uh, background. Capitalism hadn't fully developed, and so there wasn't the infrastructure to make that transition to, to socialism. And uh, Mao ends up emphasizing in various speeches in the mid fifties, the importance of, you know, letting capitalism develop the country. And if it's able to develop the productive forces and move us closer to socialism, then capitalists, uh, especially the ones that are anti-imperialist and anti-colonial and anti-feudal, end up being one of the people. They end up being within the revolutionary classes. That's the whole period of new democracy whose spirit really ends up coming back uh, with uh, the reform and opening, opening up in 78, and that had started before the founding of the PRC in 49, because you had these liberta liberated areas that had these mixed uh, uh, modes of production where the Communist Party led it. But uh, the sort of sites here, and this is the last point, a very important uh, uh, lecture that Mao does, where he makes this distinction between political, political capital and economic capital. And he says that what we can never give the bourgeoisie even a little inch of is political capital. We have to hold political supremacy. The proletariat, the Communist Party needs to hold political supremacy. That's what the dictatorship of the proletariat entails. Uh, economic supremacy and economic capital, you know, it depends on what role the bourgeoisie can play in developing it. And that's very important. And that's in line with the spirit of Lenin, who said that in socialist society, the emphasis ends up turning uh, in as a defining characteristic of society from economics to politics. What ends up being most important is politics because politics for the first time ever in history is self-conscious of the role of economics and politics and et cetera. Sorry, that was a kind of a rant, but no, that's all right. Um, Sebastian, thank you for the super chat. He says he's on the train, but he can't wait to watch this back. And that reminds me of the train analogy that Lacerdo uses in this essay where he talks about, um, imagine two trains leaving the station. The one is the inequality that exists within China, and the other is the inequality that exists between China and the rest of the world or the developed world. 
Um, and clearly, you know, China is increasing their overall wealth. The one train um, is speeding ahead and China's catching up with the world to the point where they're now leading the world, the second largest economy. Um, and some people have argued that the, the inequality within China because of that has run away. Um, it's uh, there's no way to reel it in. Um, but this is untrue, as we've seen by the efforts of Xi Jinping to combat inequality, combat corruption, um, which is also a way to maintain um, political control, control of political power by the proletariat and wrest it from um, the bourgeoisie. Uh, but also part of the reason that there was inequality is because there are so many different regions in China. And as Carlos said, some of them had mixed modes of production. Some of them are close to the sea where they have a lot of ports and a lot of access to commerce. Some of them are landlocked. Some of them are rural. Some of them are in mountainous regions. Um, so a lot of the inequality that existed wasn't even between capitalists and workers. It was between different regions in China. And what they've done through the poverty alleviation efforts is, you know, massively reduce inequality and massively increase standard of living in the rural regions, bringing health care and Wi-Fi and uh, water and, and shelter to the rural regions. And another big part of that has been uh, giving the the rural Chinese citizens plots of land where they can grow their own means of subsistence and where they're given supplies and tools by the government to grow their own means of subsistence. So, you know, ultimately the idea that that growing inequality during what's called the wild 90s or right after the reform and opening up period, you know, symbolize or means that China is not socialist anymore is pretty absurd, especially if you look at the last 10, 20 years and what China has done to combat um, the animal spirits of capitalism. I keep falling back to that analogy because it, it's such a good one. Um, you also have the analogy Xi Jinping uses in the governance of China, where he talks about the visible hand versus the invisible hand. Right? The in, we know that the invisible hand's a thing. We know that the market uh, does its thing and private capital does its thing. But we have the visible hand. We have the state um, and the state-run industries um, that are controlled uh, by the party and by the people. And even you know the, the private capital, the private corporations that do exist in China um, are still under the direction of the state and aren't allowed to um, go against the, the plans of the state. I also want to just say thank you to Kyle Parker for the $2 super chat. I really, really appreciate that. Uh, as I said, necessary to do what we do on the show. And we would love to have Diego Rusarin on the stream sometime. We will definitely reach out to him about doing that soon. I think this is a good question um, uh, from Japanese. Uh, he says, interesting thoughts on China equals state capitalism. David Harvey has said once you open your doors to capitalism, it cannot be tamed, if I understand them correctly. Uh, and Professor Wolf says that the U.S. and the USSR both vacillate from state and private capitalism. And in all, they uh, seem to think that the USSR wasn't uh, then and China isn't now socialist. Someone correct me if I have missed it either Harvey or Wolf. No, you haven't misunderstood them. That is um, that is what they say, and it's wrong. <laughs> um, uh, the Roland Bohr, Not Some Otherism article, uh, he addresses the uh, claims by David Harvey that China is state capitalist, um, and Wolf's claims are of a somewhat uh, similar character. What both of these people end up forgetting, uh, and it's a point that, that uh, uh, Lenin makes, in, uh, in criticizing Kautsky and how it was that he supported the First World War, and I reference this in, in my book on the purity fetish, Kautsky said, well, the First World War is not a purely imperialist war. You have in certain sections of the people involved national liberation struggles, and because it's not purely imperialist, we can support it. Um, and what ends up happening is that uh, because these places are not purely socialism, uh, or what they consider to be socialism in the case of uh, Dick Wolf, it's um, worker cooperatives and you know full democratization of the workplace. In the case of um, Harvey, something somewhat similar. They're both working together in democracy at work, Wolf's project. Uh, since it's not purely socialist, then it could be rejected. Um, and what it misses is the fact that there's no such thing as a pure mode of production or a pure mode of life. Right, the feudal mode of life contained different forms of property relations and forms of production. You had like merchant capitalists in the feudal mode of production, but that doesn't mean that because there was merchant capital uh, that there was capitalism. Uh, 
in the capitalist mode of production, you sustain certain feudal modes of property. That doesn't mean that it's feudalism. In the capitalist mode of production, you have, you know, like a, a store that's like a few minutes from my house, a cooperative neighborhood store, which is a form of socialistic arrangement. That doesn't mean that it's socialism. Richard Wolff wouldn't say that, okay, if we get like 100 new cooperatives in the US, now we have socialism, right? Because these modes of production, you have to look at which one is the dominant one, the one through which all the other ones are mediated, which is the dominant form of production. Under capitalism, it's capitalist commodity production. It's guided by the market. Under Chinese socialism, under Soviet socialism, et cetera, et cetera, it wasn't. It was different forms of, of socialist state-owned, people-owned, people-controlled, commanded, planned uh, property. And then the market is mediated by that, and private property and the development of capitalist property is mediated by that, and it's made to serve the ends of the main dominant economic mode, which is the socialist mode. And there's very specific details uh, that show how it is that they do that. For instance, in corporations, there's a percentage of members of the Communist Party that you need in certain corporations in order for those corporations to run. And that's done for the sake of uh, assuring uh, for the, the Communist uh, Party members within the corporation, assuring that there aren't practices that end up super exploiting the working class. And that if the company grows, the growth is reflected also in the common prosperity uh, in the working class. And so uh, just measures like that, the, the state intervention in the market to ensure that it's working for the sake of people and not just in a very predatory fashion for the sake of capital. Like it functions completely different. So yeah, there is capitalist private property and yes, there are markets, but they don't function anywhere near to how they function in the Western capitalist imperialist states because the dominant mode of production and the state uh, power is in the hands of the people. It's a socialist mode of production that mediates everything else. For sure. Great, great explanation. I think another interesting focus of Lacerdo's piece is the criticism of populism um, or sort of this religious obsession with like the righteous poor or with the idea that because China's not in poverty anymore, they're no longer socialist. They're no longer pure, which is something that that the Western left has um, has plagued the Western left for a long time. Um, and sort of this obsession um, with poverty, right? And this uh, idealizing um, poverty versus Marxism sees capitalism as a fetter on the productive forces, right? Capitalism prevents the productive forces from developing at a certain point, causing the relations of production to burst asunder. Um, so China in advancing their productive forces and in becoming powerful has caused a lot of leftists to condemn it, you know, for say, uh, people getting rich, you know, look at all the millionaires, there's millionaires and billionaires in China. Um, you know, forgetting, uh, the train analogy that we just gave with China's need to, to, um, uh, decrease global inequality and all the efforts they've made to, to decrease inequality within their own country. Um, and then, you know, also the claims of China just being an imperialist power, you know, they're rich, there's finance in China. Okay, that, that doesn't necessarily mean they're imperialist. Who's the finance controlled by? Well, all the banks are owned by the state, you know, who controls the state, the party and the working class, the politics are controlled by the working masses. So um, that's why China's Belt and Road Initiative and, and China's global loans to other countries are focused on developing industry in those countries, developing equity, mm -hmm. uh, meaning um, building things that make more money as time passes, you know, building productive infrastructure that's going to help make these countries rich so they can be a trading partner with China for a long time. That's why China's canceling debt. That's why the interest rate on these loans are set at around 4% which was the same interest rate that the U.S. gave to their allies in West Europe during the Marshall Plan so that they could build them up, create a buffer between them and communism and, and have trading partners for the next 70 years. Mm -hmm. um, so it's there's this obsession or this hatred of, of wealth, you know, on this sort of puritanical religious uh, hatred of wealth on the Western left that causes them to condemn China that uh, Lacerdo critiques really well in this. And that what that ends up showing, and I make a, I make this argument in the book on the purity fetish, is that their socialism is grounded in ressentiment, um, in simply a transvaluation of the values that dominate capitalist society. They're not able to see that, well, wealth 
has to be completely rethought of. Instead of thinking about wealth from the standpoint of capital accumulation, we have to do it from the standpoint of meeting people's needs and allowing people to flourish and growth. We need to rethink uh, growth, not abandon it. Uh, they just completely invert that. It's a transvaluation of values, and they end up just uh, with an ethic that prioritizes and that considers virtuous to be poor. Um, and they end, up, they end up feeding into, you know, what Nietzsche uh, would call slave morality. Um, and this is a mistake. This is a, a, a very, very big mistake. Socialism is not about poverty. Marx's argument is not that the capitalism develops uh, tremendously, but really we are supposed to be nice and poor and live in, in, in our poor communes. That's not, that's the opposite of what it is. Capitalism is bound to fail, one of the reasons of which is the fact that its relations of production present a fetter, present an obstacle to the development of the forces of production. We could do things better, more efficiently, and do more of it without the capitalist relations of production. It's the essence of the argument. And that rejection that you have, um, and you see it specifically after reform and opening up, where you have these poverty uh, socialists that they are uh, very dogmatic, and then uh, they end up becoming the Maoists, uh, no offense to the Maoists out there, but uh, in general terms, what the Maoists are. Um, they reject China because of that, because China developed and didn't want to sustain uh, in its pure form of production the, the sort of poverty that existed within its people and the global inequality that it was subjected to. The same reactions that these people made to reform and opening it up were made by some of the Catholic Christian socialists uh, who had this brand of poverty socialism that they were attached to, when the Soviet Union, after the difficulties that were caused by war communism, uh, where the Soviet Union was invaded I think by 14 countries, the, the major European imperialist powers and some other ones, um, it was invaded and it had to have this period of, of, of war communism. And then they break out of that period with Lenin's uh, new economic policy, which, yes, opens up a sphere uh, for, for capitalists to come in and for technicians to come back so that they could develop the forces of production. And then realizes, hey, you know, some of the comments I made in like state and revolution um, were not so correct because experience has proved that the most important thing is one, protecting the revolution and developing a strong and efficient state and, and means of productions and uh, the defenses and technology, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And sometimes because you end up being blocked from the world, the way to do that is to open yourself up to uh, the capital of, of, of the West. So the same, you know, China uh, China does something similar to that move uh, in the NEP and the same reactions that a lot of these poverty socialists, a lot of them who were Christian in, in the case of Russia that they had, which is, oh no, they betrayed socialism, they're bad. Instead of prioritizing this sort of poor ascetic communism, um, they've turned towards uh, developing the forces of production. The same thing happened with, in 78. And I think uh, Losordo quotes a, a few of the priests who ended up having that reaction to the NEP there in that article. He does. Yeah, it's it's pretty interesting. The, um, you know, that basically the same thing that happened in China with reform and opening up happened in the USSR with the NEP, where a bunch of people come up and say, you know, no, it's not real socialism. Um, which is actually a conversation I was having with a friend of mine who's a, a Maoist and um, supports China against imperialism, but, you know, ultimately thinks China is revisionist and not real socialism. Um, I sent them this and, and was making those arguments. So it was an interesting conversation. Help me understand the Maoist position better, actually. But um, yeah, do you have anything else you want to say about this piece, Carlos? I know I read it the last two days and you haven't read it in a while, but um, Obviously, you know it sort of inside and out after um, citing it um, so much in your book. But uh, I think we covered all the main um, important points here. Uh, but yeah, I recommend everyone read it. Um, you can listen to our breakdown analysis of it, and that'll help. But nothing will help you retain the information quite like reading it. Well, I mean, com combine, you know, listening to us with reading it and then you'll retain the information really, really well. Um, so, yeah. Anything else you got, Carlos? Uh, no, that's it. I think these uh, uh, short uh, scholarly articles, they're densely packed with great information. And yep. um, for those of you who, um, you know, don't have the time to read full books, I definitely recommend um, reading articles like this. You get a lot in uh 
relatively in maybe one tenth of the time of reading a whole book. Oftentimes, yeah, books are just like a few of these articles put together. Yeah, right. Lacerdo's got another really good one um, on China where that tree diagram I always use comes from. The tree diagram I try to use to explain the DPRK to Bausch. 